Welcome everyone to Cloud Computing and Big Data. Today we have lecture two, Machine Learning Models in Clouds. And this lecture will nicely connect the topic of machine learning, where we will have a very moderate introduction into this topic with the simplest learning model you can have in the space of linear learning models, linear in weights. We will understand what that means, hopefully after the first part of the lecture today. And then, of course, we want to connect the idea of doing machine learning in cloud computing. We start with this today, um, obviously, with a very simple idea of doing classification with machine learning, something we call logistic regression. But it captures the essence very nicely of firstly, CRISPDM, the different phases you have learned in one of the practical lectures earlier, but also the idea of several conceptual ideas of machine learning itself, which means training and test sets, for instance, or training a model and then evaluate a model. But before we dive into the material of lecture two, let us look what we had the last time. And the last lecture was really a 10,000 feet perspective introduction to cloud computing. So we have looked into what a cloud really entails. And if you want, you see that interesting cloud here which has, of course, very physical components like a real network between servers, storage, hardware. And then, of course, to operate those, you would say the cloud has also some software bundles, could be machine learning packages, could be cloud software like OpenStack to run all of these physical hardware. We will learn in the course much more about these different parts here. But there's one term which really is a key term in cloud computing, and this is a service term. The idea of doing services in cloud sets it a little bit apart from, you know, basically other topics like high performance computing or high throughput computing in the older times where basically all of the servers, all of the high performance computing machines were not so user friendly in a way. So there was not a simple service where you swipe your credit card and then you can host and deploy services using containers or so. There in this world in HPC, rather people using, you know, uh, basically s batch scripts and secure shell, lots of, let's say, more complicated aspects to go to these systems and using it at scale. So hence, the cloud computing course is abstracting away lots of the difficulties you would have otherwise in hardware access, in using software, let's say. Here we have certain services and we have some examples today. But also across the course, you will learn lots of lots of services as MS Azure, um, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Uber Cloud, and whatever you will find in terms of clouds, they are usually service oriented. And the idea to make profit out of this is, of course, best shown here. You basically have certain, you know, requests and you have a subscription model or a pay per use model in order to use the cloud. And you can use this paid services. Right. So this sets it a bit apart from your typical laptops and desktops of doing the computing there. So usually you use a laptop to access those clouds, but everything is remote, which was also captured nicely in one of the videos right in the last lecture one. And in a way, there are no limits, um, which should be this graphic entailing a little bit um, that we derived a little bit from grid computing. But the idea is that with cloud services, you can basically access all different types of physical devices. You can access data maybe from satellites even or from other, let's say, big storage farms. You can have a really big internet connecting to different cloud vendors and with such basically can today get access to very interesting services if you're ready to pay for it, right? Of course, this is the idea. And we left a little bit the topic of virtualization out, although we learned in lecture one that virtualization was really a key term in order to make it basically happening that this cloud really um, com comes up to speed and that cloud computing is really a successful paradigm in business today. So there basically um, we will learn a little bit in the next lectures more about virtualization, which is required for you to understand how this is all scaling to different users what means basically economics of scale in that context and things like that. Things that are not obvious to you, but we will see how that materialize over the couple of next lectures. However, going to some examples, and many of you have used already Google Docs as a cloud. Um, we have also discussed the European Open Science Cloud as a little bit and many other examples. But we learned also 
that when you look into clouds, it's still physical, right? So it's not a magic that computing inside the cloud is coming out of nowhere. Hence, they're real service. And we looked a little bit on the EC2 Amazon idea of having this elastic computing cloud, which was one of the selling idea of cloud computing, the elasticity. So it can shrink, it can grow based on your demand of computing. And it should be simple. So you can add more resources and, of course, reduce resources when they're not any more needed instead of buying your own big server in-house. Right. So which is, of course, always something you could also do. You can have a big company always can decide, well, I have a big server room. I do it on premise, as we call that. But of course, here the idea is that you don't have a cost of ownership. You basically rent the resources in the cloud. But with this, of course, you're much more flexible. Right. You can steer up, steer down the resources as needed. You can connect nicely to a lot of services that otherwise you have to implement yourself or you have to set up really um, an open stack based cloud landscape, which also requires one to two, um, you know, developers and administrators to take care of that. But if you look into the deep heart in the cloud example here of the EC2, for instance, we have seen still physical hardware is an important part of it. And we will look at some cost models and what it really means to rent these resources. When we look on some of the payment models, if you, for instance, want to have multi-core CPUs, you pay a certain price. If you want to have cutting edge GPUs, things we learned last time as well, many core GPUs, right? Like A100s from NVIDIA, cutting edge material, then there you go and pay the price. We talk about mostly here and there, like $24 an hour to rent those cutting edge GPUs. Of course, if you want to have older GPUs, they're better cost models, it's cheaper. But think about this, that also these renting costs are really dependent on not only the subscription model in terms of services you want to access, but also the underlying physical hardware you rent. And this is a concept, of course, which is quite nice. So you can choose and pick from a wide catalog of different, let's say, um, CPUs and GPU types. This includes, of course, also memory. We also discussed this a little bit in the last time of the lecture in the big data part. Mat memory matters as well, and you can steer up and down the demand there as well. And this is, of course, a nice paradigm. On the other hand, you have to always see there's the running costs all the time in the cloud when you rent it. And this is something we have to review also in the coming lectures again and again. The second part of the lecture then was a bit more on big data. We have seen big data is real and it's really characterized with this different Vs where there was a the beginning of three Vs. Um, today, we don't have this anymore. We would say there are lots of Vs there um, in terms of not only volume is a problem. We had this interesting example where I said to you also, well, the velocity here in this particular square kilometer array scientific instrument where we expect roughly one petabyte per 20 seconds here, the big data alone with one petabyte, maybe you would say the volume here is not so tough. We have tape archives that can actually get a lot of petabytes in it's a bit slow to take it out of a tape archive but in the end um, it's not a problem however the challenge here in big data is really one petabyte every 20 seconds right and this is something where tape archives will quickly run full when you have let's say a couple of months and if you talk about years of measurement we have here really a problem so there is also the question can we do filters can be maybe something that's smart idea of basically not storing everything directly. Can we filter quickly? Um, these things come into play there because it's too much a challenge to store perhaps everything. And then in order to work on big data, we have also learned that when you accumulate that data, like for instance, Facebook with all the profiles, with all the content or YouTube or wherever, you know, online social networking platform you go to, they accumulate a lot of data. And at some point in time, you have to think about, does it really make sense to transfer all these terabytes and petabytes to a big high performance computer? Or do you really want to do the computing close to the data and maybe rather more moderate computing steps? And that is so-called the idea of this big data analytics, right? Where very early on, there were ideas with Hadoop, with Spark, already um, based on the MapReduce paradigm that we reviewed a little bit the last time of putting the compute closer to the data instead of shipping the data to compute, where today with the resolutions of satellites, with the resolutions of all sorts of instruments, you probably put in all the hard disks in a truck and then drive the truck to the destination instead of using the internet.
because that would be much more better throughput. So much for the lecture one, and we had many different aspects. Of course, it was an introductionary lecture, so it was really a 10 feet perspective. Today, we want to narrow down this a little bit in machine learning. I promised you a little bit moderate introduction to deep, uh, to machine learning, which means there's no really any prerequisite. So you should learn that directly here from scratch. And then we will look a little bit how you potentially can deploy this in one cloud example um, that you basically also can play around it yourself, like Google Collaboratory or HD Insight. So we'll start with some machine learning fundamentals which are really needed. So learning methods, supervised versus unsupervised. We will have a classification application example here and there, um, which brings us to the simplest learning model you have in machine learning called the linear perception model. It's a linear learning model we will talk about, but it captures nicely the essence that again, you need a training and testing process using different data sets. Um, we bring always crisp DM, basically, right, that we discussed in one of the earlier lectures, with all the steps in context of that, so that you understand a little bit again, it's always about data preparation, perhaps before even data understanding, before you do any modeling or machine learning. And then once you do the machine learning, of course, and you have a linear regression model, a logistic regression model, it doesn't matter. You have some evaluations to do if the model is really right, if it gives the accuracy right, if they could recall precision. The different evaluation models, we will talk briefly about it. Needless to say that, of course, this is a machine learning fundamental short briefing. So if you want to really learn machine learning, I would uh, basically recommend you to take the machine learning course we have here at the university. In the second part, then we would have um, basically the machine learning and clouds, um, basically based on logistic regression, a little bit where we do some stepwise idea how you can now use basically um, data together with the cloud in a very simple example. But still, we put the crisp DM parts into the game. We will see it's very similar like the machine learning fundamentals, but this time we really apply it to real data inside the cloud. But there, the same steps actually remain. You still have to do model evaluation. Here and there, you would do some visualization techniques for this, uh, for certain elements like the uh, area under the rock core, for instance, which is known. And then we will finish a little bit with an outlook what other services can be there to make it a bit simpler uh, from other cloud vendors like AWS, Amazon SageMaker, which is quite a machine learning tool set today. So, Let's start with machine learning fundamentals. So machine learning has different facets. And you remember one of the earlier lectures, we had unsupervised learning, we had supervised learning, and there's some other, let's say, um, you know, semi-supervised learning or reinforcement learning. They're different categories. So for the idea today of the lecture, we stick a little bit to the supervised learning model. And we learned that the supervised learning model in a way is one of the best understood and easiest, so to speak, because we have this guiding wise, this label, we call it, right? There's an input data, which could be all sorts of points you see here for one group or another group. And the interesting thing is we have already the output for those known. So we know these are red points. We know these are green points, right? This is encapsulated in this Y. So this is a guiding output for us, which means it's a supervised learning we can do and apply with this because supervised in the sense that we have always to help with the guiding label Y here to help us as a supervisor, so to speak, are we doing the right learning model? Hence, uh, we will focus on the supervised learning today. But of course, the key goal is then to have a supervised learning model created that then for new unseen data will be able to tell us if it's a red or green group, which is of course then to find the label, so to speak, for this particular fellow here. But before we do this, we can really learn nicely, so to speak, from all the labeled data sets we have here with the input vector X and the data points. And then, of course, the dimensions and features you have for each one in this kind of vector. And then for all of these, basically, in this kind of dimension, we would have always a guiding Y. And that helps us quite nicely to do machine learning. And if you remember, we always said we always have to think about the three ingredients for machine learning just to briefly check. There should be some pattern existing, and if there's a mathematical formula, then basically we don't really necessarily need machine learning, but in many of the ideas here in machine learning, of course, we would have not such a mathematical formula directly. Sometimes we do this in terms of, you know, function approximation, something we 
derive a little bit from statistics then, but we still learn the coefficients. We still learn the linear learning model that we do here, which of course in the end comes out a little bit like a mathematical formula, but this is not given to us completely. We have to still learn the weights. We have to learn the coefficients. And this is one of the points here, of course, why we do machine learning. And the third one, as I said to you also earlier, data has to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to do machine learning. And in this particular example, we have exactly this given. So this is a very typical introductionary um, idea of what you do with classification. We have here basically the idea of the business understanding first now in the CRISP. So what we want to do. So what we have is we have lots of labeled data of the iris It's a specific type of a flower. And we call that basically a typical, um, you know, labeled data set where we have one class very nicely labeled and another class, which is the iris virginica. Now, the classical point idea was, as I said to you, the new fellow, right? We want to know automatically what is this flower about? Now, for us humans, it's relatively hard to do. Um, I think you agree with me. It's not so easy to determine now is it iris virginica or iris So here we are in the business understanding phase and want to now understand, okay, when we have a new flower which looks like iris flower, which subtype of iris is it really? So we have groups of data and we want to have new data, new unseen data to classify it. So we call that the learning problem in this example and basically want to predict if this flower, this new image that comes in, is basically now a Citosa or a Virginica. In other words, we would call that problem a two-class classification problem. Two-class makes it binary, zero, one, so to speak. And basically, this is the idea now of our business understanding in the CRISPR-M example. So what we want to do, we want to do a prediction task. And now the next steps, when you now go towards the data understanding phase in CRISP is now, what could help us there? So what is the idea now, which in this image here could help us to do such a prediction task? And you would say what attributes in the data sets or which features in the data set basically helping us to do this task. And with this, we come quickly to the next part of the data understanding phase. So knowing that we want to differentiate all these different ones, and if you know a little bit about flowers in this particular type of kind, um, we are very lucky that we have a labeled data set which exists and which gives us so-called sepal and petal length. You see that a little bit here. So basically there's a labeled data set that has not only the class, as we said, our guiding input Y, right? Is it this iricitosa or virginica? But basically also this kind of sepal and petal length. For the sake of the course today, and to keep it very simple, I actually um, ruled out the iris vesicular. So we have not 150 labeled examples as originally exists in this iris data set. Instead, I just picked 100. There's a certain point to it called linear separability that I will basically talk to you another time. And then we will pick up on this example why this was useful to put the iris vesicular in the first introductionary lecture out because it's not linear separable then. Now with iris and iris it's basically pretty simple. And the nice thing is now we have attributes which seem to have an, basically a role to play in machine learning in order to basically understand how we can now differentiate these flowers, right? So um, that means there's a pattern of petal width and you know sepal length and so on. And we know there's no mathematical formula right now that actually can just implement this problem, right? That's what our job now is as machine learners. And we have data sets, as I said, not 150. I sample 50 out. So, so much for the data understanding. Usually in data understanding, you would start plotting the data a little bit. You will inspect the data. And if you now plot it just simply these two classes of Iris Itosa and Iris Virginica, you quickly see some grouping. Right. So what we do now is just printing the X vector of the dimension. Let's say we have just peta length and peta width to keep it simple. Two dimensions, right? Attributes. And we do this for every little point. We can do this nicely in 2D. So here you already see alluding to this analogy here, what I had with groups. So basically we have here two groups coming out of this, which of course in the moment are not really, you know, labeled yet. So it's just painting the rough X, right? There's no guiding output right now. 
but we have 100 samples Erisitosa erysogenica, and we already see, we believe there's a pattern, and it seems to be true. So depending on the PETA width and PETA lengths, we can find somehow a grouping of this data of these two classes. However, we also have the class labels, remember? So we can paint this also, and then we, of course, because it's a supervised learning setup, we can here from the data understanding really understand that in the Iris Virginica case, it seems to be much higher numbers in PETA lengths and PETA width than the Iris Itosa. Now we have used the labels, of course, to paint this. And now we have this group set up that kind of already assumes, okay, there seemed to be a pattern, but this is not machine learning yet, right? Of course, it's a necessary ingredient of preparing the data and, you know, having data understanding done. So machine learning comes into play when we now think the next step, how we prepare something that can, you know, do now the decision for us. Let's assume there's a point coming here at this particular part with a specific PETA width and PETA length. So what does it mean? Is it rather Iris Cetosa or Iris Virginica? That's now where we start about doing decisions, machine learning ideas. We call that a decision boundary, and that's what we want to do, what we want to model, right? So in a way, we want to have one line that tells us if we are above the line, we probably are Iris Virginica. If we are below the line, we're probably Iris Cetosa. And this is the simplest binary classification you can see here. So finding a line that separates these two classes. And it seems to be possible because it's not overlapping. It's quite some distance between the different groups here. So in a way, a very nice, um, you know, idea of doing classification. And we use, of course, now the labels. So this is, you know, can maybe also help us to find these decision boundary. Because if I put a decision boundary here, I can easily recognize that, well, these would be wrongly classified because I have the labels. Hence, we're going now to the data understanding phase, more to the data preparation phase and modeling, and have to think, what can us help now of separating this? And of course, we are searching for a so-called machine learning model now. But before we do this, we have a so-called mathematical notation um, to make it mathematically convenient a little bit to understand what we really do with this line, right? And we have to see that the line is basically pretty simple, if you remember a little bit from linear algebra, um, with having essentially um, this kind of idea of a line, which is essentially um, shown here in terms of dimensions. So we can say everything above this threshold should be Iris Virginica and Iris Itosa. That's what we discussed in the last slide. Um, now, the interesting thing is that, of course, for us as machine learners, X is a constant, right? So this is nice. That's our data set, the attributes of the flowers. So this is something that is pure data. Now, the only challenge, so to speak, for us is now X is given, as we know, basically to find the right Ws and, of course, the threshold, if you know a little bit through the line equations, right? There's always the threshold that you have to do to put the orientation of the line, know where it sits in the space. And we have to learn these two red fellows, um, basically, to make it really then to say it's zero, we call that a sine function, minus one or plus one, uh, which could be so called a compact notation. And basically we have the sine information as well. If you remember, that's the output y that is given. If it's a plus one, irisogenica. If it's a minus one, irisitosa. That is what we can simply model by just, you know, getting the text, you know, changed to really mathematical numbers, plus one and minus one. And then we can use a sine function here in order to get to this. But what we still have to learn is these red parts, right? And here's where machine learning now starts into play. So this was all a mathematical convenient idea to get to something we called the perceptron learning model. And this was one of the earliest in machine learning you see here, 1970, right? In the 60s, it became really up to speed, which is modeled after a neuron in the human brain, so to speak. You have this X, which is our data set as constant input. And then you basically have this different weights that should model a little bit what's happening in the neuron to really connect the different, let's say, inputs and then fire up in the neuron a so-called activation function. So in the beginning, this would be just a step function, sine function, minus one and plus one and so on. So very simple. But here you have basically the, the simplest ingredient to a large neural network that we will discuss also throughout the course.
So you have here the basic building block. And by giving the training data here inside this, basically we can put in the signal again and again, and we have the guiding Y as well that makes it supervised, right? This is a plus one or minus one. So that's what we have. So again, we are able then to have this, you know, weights that we discussed earlier here learned maybe by using the signal that we put in again and evaluate if it's really the Y. And then we have to find a way to change the Ws. And of course, the bias here, X0 is modeled in, in the compact notation in a way of saying the threshold can be modeled as X1, X0, making X0 1. But then, of course, having, you know, this threshold also to be learned, which is then, so to speak, the weight zero to learn the bias. And this is the first idea of the perceptual learning model. And if you have an example of a Boolean function here, um, just to show you that this really works, this simple model, um, you can really, um, you know, try this out. You see here the data and the guiding label Y. And here are basically now the output of the process of the modeling. That would be now basically a learned machine learning model. How we learn is still not obvious to you. We see how that materializes in the next couple of slides. I just wanted to show you the end results. After the training, giving the training data, we want to have something which satisfies this equation correctly, right? So the sign should be absolutely correct when we do x1 and x3, x2 as inputs to this, combined linearly using weights. Now, these weights we have learned in this particular example, saying they're all 0 0.3. And then we have also learned the threshold here, the bias, which is 0 0.4. And you can do the math if you want to put now in the equation all the data from this, all the weights, all the x's into this particular function. And you come out with, let's say, different examples. But here are two of them. If you want to, for instance, um, put in an example of consider sample three here of putting one, one and zero in, um, you will have particular this example. Or if you have consider simple six, then it's basically minus one. Because the sum is negative minus 0 0.1, the sine function here will say, okay, then it's just minus. And the, here, the plus function 0 0.2, even if it's combined linearly, not exactly, of course, one, but the, the kind of step function here in the activation will make sure it's a plus one. And with this, you have your modeling done. There's just one thing we didn't catched yet and of course this is now the learning in the game so here we're talking about we have now satisfied the equation we know the weights but how do you get to the weights how do you know which weights are 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 this was now artificially put by me so basically that is something still we have to do right so hence we have a perceptual learning model that seems to work and we can put that into our hypothesis set alongside support vector machines, neural networks, and many sophisticated deep learning models today. And we have put out of the hypothesis set that we can basically take the perceptual learning model. Yeah, our hypothesis from X. However, we still have to have a learning algorithm to it, right? It really makes these Ws happening and basically learning these particular values. And these are, if you know a little bit about, you know, thinking about the equation of a line, then changing the direction in space, right? The kind of, if you move it now, this line through space, by changing the values here, you will see sometimes the line is here, sometimes the line is there. So basically, these red parameters correspond to the orientation of the line somewhere in space. So with this, you also can see we can cross boundaries here, and probably the green one suddenly is misclassified or the blue one here is misclassified if you put a line here. Hence, with the kind of hypothesis and then also the given data, we can always go back and check, is that really the case? So is basically this an Iris Virginica with this particular values? And it seems to be not if it's misqualified, so we have to continue the learning. So, and this is an algorithm we will come to um, but of course, let us just for mathematical convenience, just reveal a couple of uh, reminders, maybe from linear algebra so that you are not, you know, carried away by some interesting different notations. They're all very simple. It just takes a refresh, perhaps for some of you. When we talk about W transpose X, um, basically, it's the same like the dot product. You probably remember maybe something about linear algebra. Right. And this is basically um, the points that are on the decision boundary. If it's zero here, 
Um, but what we want to do is to change these w's while x is constant, right? This is given. So hence, we can simplify what we have talked before by putting the bias as w0 inside this, so to speak. The bias is always then, you know, x0 and w0. And we learn that as well by having instead of this complicated sum or linear sum, just the w transpose x. The transpose is here necessary, as you see here, to make it to a vector that can be multiplied then with our feature vector, which is up to the dimension of the data. So sepa width, sepa length, for instance. So, and for further simplification, this is all here, this also very basically equivalent to the dot product notation, which is often find in literature, the very convenient one, which is, you know, now making it very simple. In the end, we are still doing the same thing we have seen here. We just model the W0, you know, as a threshold, put that inside basically the idea of the to be learned weights, although it's not directly corresponding to an input. So we put the X0 input always as one, but this doesn't hurt us because we have to learn W0 anyway. And in this sense, we kind of, yeah, prepare a little bit the data. We put it in a notation with, you know, kind of X of the data. Um, we don't have so much data preparation to do now. We do this more in the second part, basically today, but we can start the modeling. And the modeling is often part, not only of switching to some sort of a learning model, but also to have an associated learning algorithm. That's how machine learning works. You have support vector machines. You have quadratic programming as the learning aspect. You have uh, neural networks. You have backpropagation of error or backpropagation algorithms as the learning in it. And then some optimization steps usually, like stochastic gradient descent. We capture a little bit in the next part of the course. But here you find then the perceptual learning algorithm that goes with the perceptual learning model in order to now really pick the Ws in order to find the Ws that actually satisfy the data. I have a small uh, visualization here how that really works, and it's pretty simple algorithms, just changing the orientation of a vector, really. But the point is, if the linear separability of the data is given, so you can actually draw a line between the red and the blue dots here, or our green and red dots, it doesn't matter, really, then this algorithm is guaranteed to be successful once more, right? So we can find a line that separates these two classes just by following this totally simple algorithm because the data is linearly separable. So how that works is you just pick any misclassified point out of your basically label training data set. You can always evaluate basically if it's now the right, um, you know, Erisitosa, Erisogenica plus one or a minus one because you have this, you know, kind of guiding um, supervised output also given, right, which is, says the class label. So if that is misclassified, you usually come to the update of the weight vector. That's now the point, right? You want to have an update to the weight. And you see here how that works. It's usually just adding or subtracting a vector because you have plus minus one with, for the guiding output y, right? So this corresponds to basically adding a vector to your you know, vector w, which means a little bit in space now, this hopping of the line. So you switch this line orientation incredibly often when you have a misclassified point because to here and there are adding or subtracting a vector line depending on which class it actually is. And of course, you do this again and again and again, and that's now machine learning, right? It tests iteratively a lot, a lot of these steps to do. And then when there are no misclassified points in the end after 10,000 iterations or so, then it converges and you have the line that we were searching for. And this is a perceptual learning algorithm. Of course, it is a relatively simple algorithm. It will fill the Ws we need and will basically give us a decision boundary also for our Iris data set that now tells us absolutely accurately, this is one line you can have to differentiate basically now the Irisitosa to the Irisogenica. And this new point is below the line, so it's probably an Irisitosa. Obviously, there are many different lines to be found with such an ad hoc algorithm and support vector machines establish this as a bit more, let's say, in a principled fashion using the maximum margin. And this is a much more elaborate algorithm doing basically the same job. But here you have a very simple iterative machine learning 
algorithm here that you can find that actually does a job, captures the idea of machine learning very well. Some Just some summary of terminologies before we move ahead. Right, so machine learning models is what you learned now. We have neural networks, we have support vector machines, we have deep learning networks, convolutional neural networks, lots of them. What you learn today is a perceptron learning model. And it goes with the perceptron learning algorithm we have seen with hopping this vector, adding and subtracting vectors. We have learned a labeled data set. So we have always this input vector, which is of course then giving us the dimensions of the data like SEPA with SEPA lengths for one particular point in the data, but also the guiding output Y all the time for each dot. This is, of course, glorious supervised training examples. Still, we have to cut here and there to a training set and test set. And we will look into this a little bit more now in the second part also of the lecture later. Right. So why we have to do this and so on. And one of the ideas why we do this is that we don't want to learn what's in the data set right now. We want not to memorize this, rather we want to learn from it to get out of sample points in the future right, right? That's what you learn today as well. So what is about the new flower that we have on the picture where we don't know if it's a Eurycytosa or if it's Virginica? Now we want to have some rules, some decision boundary to know. And basically this data set part one training set and test set is now something we will look into more. So this is not completely obvious to you right now. And we will see how that materialized when we go to the later parts of this lecture. Another takeaway message is now this nonlinear aspect where we talk nonlinearity also here in weights. It makes it linear learning models, admittedly very trivial models to do modeling. But of course, you can pick now from different models. You have linear classifications. That's what we did basically. And the linear separability was given in the data. That is unfortunately in practice not always given. But still, we have seen with a linear combination of the inputs using weights, we can do the job and create this if the data is linear separable. Then there's another model called linear regression, which basically gives you a real valued output. So regression is not a fancy term. It's just saying more or less real valued output, something really coming out. And you want to maybe do a trend analysis, maybe how much sales do you give to marketing and commercials in TV advertising to really get you know, higher sales, something like this. And then logistic regression is something we want to allude to in the second part of the lecture much more deeply, where we take now this linear signal that we got out. And instead of using just a simple sign function for minus one and plus one, we maybe can do a more probabilistic aspect to it. Um, this is called the sigmoid function, um, which squashes everything between zero and one. And if you know a little bit about probability, that's what we do in Basically, statistics, there is a probability between 0 and 1. It is this class or that class. So this would be a little bit more elaborate and needs also some optimization. But essentially, we talk about another linear learning model that we can look in here in the logistic regression case and then put it to the kind of function here. So it's still the similar idea of using the linear combination inputs and weights, but we take the signal and putting it then to the logistic function that we will talk about. As an appetizer, how that works, I brought you a small video to close the first part of the session here. It's a nice summary also very clearly described in my opinion. So logistic regression I had a brief introduction last time, but I'll just explain again how you get from a general linear model, which could be expressed like this, so um, it's just a, a linear equation, how you get to a logistic regression from that. In logistic regression, you're actually trying to predict a probability rather than a continuous measurement that you were predicting in the general linear model. So this y is your observations, which will have a value of 0 or 1, something happens or it doesn't, so you can code them as 0 or 1. They're going to be predicted by a probability in the model plus an error term. But in terms of modelling a probability, I mean, you've got to be quite careful. You can't model it on a linear scale because it's got a range of 0 to 1. You can't have negative probabilities. You can't have probabilities of greater than 1. So that's where this transformation of probabilities comes in. So and that's called a link function. And in the case of logistic regression, you take the log of this predicted probability over 1 minus the predicted probability and 
you say that that's equal to the terms in your model. So we're now expressing those on a linear scale. So it's this log of the probability over 1 minus the probability which links the parameters in the model to the actual data, which is something that has a value of 0 or 1 because it may or may not happen. And this graph just sort of illustrates how this value here, which is sometimes called a logit, and it has a range, you know, it's got a linear range, it can go from minus infinity really up to plus infinity, but if you back transform that value to get the probability, it's always going to have a range of 0 to 1, which is exactly what we want to have a probability. So that's the trick that's involved in logistic regression. So you can do your modelling, but you can base the outcome on a binary variable. All right, so that brings us basically to the close of the first part of today. And we will continue then and pick several of these topics up again, and also the CRISPR-DM again in the second part when we do it a bit in clouds. So we break here for 10 minutes and come back then.